Hi everyone. Welcome to our discussion on the applications of sub terahertz frequencies to wireless communications. Our distinguished guest today is Dr. Ted Rappaport. Ted is the David Lee Ernst Weber Professor of Electrical Engineering at the NYU Tandem School of Engineering. And he's also a professor of computer science at NYU's current Institute of Mathematical Sciences and a professor of radiology at the NYU School of Medicine. Ted's past research has provided the technical underpinnings behind some of the advances in wireless communications that have changed how we live, work, and play. He's now continuing this work as he develops key technologies for 6G. Ted was elected to the National Academy of Engineering in February. This is one of the highest professional distinctions accorded to an engineer. Congratulations, Ted, and welcome. Thank you, Marcus. It's great to be with you and with NI. Ted, you've done a lot of work in wireless communications over many years. What makes you most excited about sub terahertz as a key technology for 6G? Well, I've been very blessed to have a great career in wireless. Um, ever since I was five, I've been passionate about it when my grandpa showed me, showed me an old shortwave radio. And throughout my career, I've always tried to be at the forefront of the new frequency bands before they were commercially viable and oftentimes not even thought to be viable. I mean, starting with my PhD, I was up over a gigahertz back when cellular was at 450 megahertz and 900 megahertz. Uh, so I'm really excited about the move to sub terahertz and terahertz because the bandwidths there are gonna be so much greater than we ever thought possible. And when you get super, or I call it ultra wideband, uh, literally ultra wideband or massively broadband channels, you get virtually zero latency and the ability to start transmitting data rates comparable to the rate at which our human brain thinks. So I've actually been thinking the last few years that we're going to be soon in an era where we're able to send data in real time at the rate a human brain processes. And that's pretty remarkable. So what are some of the new services that sub terahertz could enable? We talk about mobility, we talk about fixed backhaul. What do we have here? We're talking about all of it. And I know people are skeptical about mobility, working even in today's 5G millimeter wave bands, but it will happen. But even up to above 100 gigahertz, above 300 gigahertz, uh, we published a paper recently that shows there's really nothing fundamental in the channel up to 900 gigahertz, almost to a terahertz. And when you start talking about 900 gigahertz carrier frequencies, you can start talking about RF bandwidths of 10, 20, 50 gigahertz of RF bandwidth. And I believe at these frequencies, we're going to be doing mobile, we're going to do fixed backhaul, we're gonna do fiber replacement. Uh, those kinds of things will be done in the core of the network over the next decade or two. And also on the device, when we start looking at the mobile phone of the future, it will be able to do spectroscopy, imaging, seeing behind walls, uh, super accurate position location. We're working on a lot of these things now at NYU Wireless. But the move to these uh, sub terahertz frequencies and much greater bandwidths and much more directional antennas are gonna enable all of these kinds of things. Super wide backhaul, super wide bandwidth mobility, and then new applications and services on the smartphone itself, where radar and sensing and imaging and spectroscopy all exploit the massive bandwidths that are coming. Okay, um, well, five mil 5G millimeter wave adoption is significantly behind earlier market predictions. What do you see as a future timeline for millimeter waves and sub terahertz in applications that will affect the consumers? Well, I don't know how far behind they are. Certainly COVID has put the rollout of 5G millimeter wave, uh, a little, maybe a little bit behind, but, but think about 4G. 4G was talked about in 2009, 2010, and its rollout really didn't begin in the US until in earnest 2012. So I don't think we're that far behind. COVID's put us a little bit behind. You know, the small cell movement is what the 5G millimeter wave infrastructure needs. And that's starting to happen. You're starting to see small cells deployed. Uh, you know, that involves permitting and the engineers need to learn about 
more of the site-specific design needed for 5G millimeter wave, but it's happening. It's happening, I'd say, at a rate uh, not, not too far off from what I would have expected. So 5G millimeter wave is happening in major cities around the world at yeah, millimeter wave. And as engineers become more comfortable with it and as the price points drop, which will happen as we get more 5G mobile phones that are millimeter wave equipped, and as the more of the competitors get into their second generation of uh, designs, dropping the cost and power consumption, we're going to see that ramp. So just like 4G LTE took a little while beyond its initial launch and hype, 5G millimeter waves doing the same thing. And what about uh, the timeline for sub terahertz applications? Well, the FCC was the first government in the world to open up frequencies above 95 gigahertz uh, with uh, four unlicensed bands. And you see uh, British Ofcom, that's FCC equivalent, opening up three unlicensed bands between 100 and 200 gigahertz. Uh, Asia is following suit. So you're seeing these bands open up. So you'll see Wi-Fi and mobility come probably in the next five to 10 years. Remember Wi-Fi, the unlicensed, original unlicensed ISM bands were opened up by the FCC in 1985 for spread spectrum. And it wasn't until 1990 or 91, six years after that, that the first spread spectrum Wi-Fi modem, the NCR Waveland came out. So typically five to six years of when the FCC or a major government opens up a new spectrum, it takes for the first products to come. And then as engineers become comfortable and as designs become uh, baked in and the cost of silicon and silicon germanium in this case is driven down, then the products come. So you're probably looking six to seven years from now to where you're gonna have the first prototype, uh, 100 gigahertz, 200 gigahertz mobile cell phones. And we're probably 10 years away from uh, where 6G will start incorporating these frequencies above 100 gigahertz, I believe. Okay. So what kind of uh, research experiments are you conducting in the sub terahertz band today? Yeah, we've been, we've been doing a lot of work uh, looking above 100 gigahertz. We did a lot of work on 73 gigahertz a few years ago because we saw 73 being, in fact, uh, it was a bit prescient because uh, that's now an extension of the unlicensed band. We did a lot of comp and a lot of urban microcell work around the New York City, Brooklyn campus of NYU Wireless. Uh, we've been doing 140 gigahertz for the last few years, really studying that band going up a factor of two from our 73 gigahertz work. And we now have papers in uh, submission now studying the entire millimeter wave band from 28 gigahertz up to 140 gigahertz, and we're starting to look to 200 and 280 gigahertz, those kind of frequencies for our next move. Uh, we're going into factories at 140 gigahertz, looking at intelligent reflective surfaces. But the bottom line is what we're finding is that the radio channel, the fundamentals, the physics, once you get out of the near field of the antenna, once you're within the first meter or so, the channel is remarkably the same from 28 all the way out to 140 gigahertz. And we think that's going to carry pretty much all the way out to several hundred gigahertz. Uh, so we're, we're really looking at different environments at 140 gigahertz, looking at the kinds of applications, imaging, seeing behind walls, uh, ultra accurate position location that you can start to get with these wide bandwidths and these very narrow beam antennas. So you mentioned a lot of work that you're doing in terms of the channel and propagation. Uh, what technical innovations are still needed to make terahertz practical for communications? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, ideally, you're going to have these mobile and fixed wireless links available in very low cost, low weight drones, cars of the future, uh, you know, portable devices, IoT. So the price point and power efficiency really has to become better than it is now. So power efficiency, packing large number of antennas in a physically small space with low interconnects is a big issue for the mobile industry, trying to make very efficient antennas, steerable antennas, easily calibrated RF amplifiers that are power efficient. A lot of great work is going on in that around the world. And also, I think we're going to have to have the ability to bring more of the content to the edge. So a lot of this edge caching and smart edge edge cloud kind of computing uh, to take advantage of these wide bandwidths and low latencies, that infrastructure has to be built out 
with the commensurate security to make future uh, Wi-Fi, mobile, cellular networks uh, safe and secure. Those are, I see, uh, the fundamental challenges. The RF components, the electronics, the power efficiency, and the interconnects. Because when you get up to these hundreds of gigahertz carrier frequencies, you know, it's it's kind of like the way the, the automobile, you know, 20 years ago, you could work on any car engine. Now it's all condensed, solid state, very hard to work on a car. Electronics are going to become that way. Everything's going to become integrated. The antenna, the RF amplifier, the, the phasing networks. Uh, even at the base station, it's going to be going that way. So I think those are the challenges, getting the heat out and getting the uh, RF devices power efficient and building the hundreds and thousands of elements of antennas where the wavelength is the size of a human freckle. You know, you're going to have lots of packaging density. It's going to be a challenge, but we'll overcome it just like we've done throughout the history of wireless. Thank you. Well, I hope you found the video that we just showed as enjoyable and as instructive as I did. Thank you all for attending. I'd like for you to join me in thanking Dr. Ted Rappaport for talking with us today, for the insights he provided us about subterahertz, and for his contributions to past and current generations of wireless communications. And uh, for many more G's to come. Thank you, Ted. <laughs> You're welcome, Marcus. Thank you, and thanks to the great support of NI at NYU Wireless.